<laughs> interesting time. Um, so I just want to say good morning to everybody who's who's here, to our panelists and to our, all our attendees. Um, you're very welcome. Um, we're really glad to have you all join us today for our um webinar, Dancing with Dementia. Um, my name is Vanessa Moore. I'm the Scientific Project Manager of Dementia Research Network Ireland, or DRNI. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with DRNI, um, it's an all-Ireland dementia and neurodegeneration research initiative. Um, so it seeks to support um, interdisciplinary research that integrates both or basic clinical and social science research uh, within the area of dementia and neurodegeneration. Um, today's webinar is part of an ongoing webinar series that we have called Hot Topics in Dementia Research. Um, you can find all of our former webinars um, on e um, our YouTube site, um, DRNI's YouTube page, if you just search for Dementia Research Networks Ireland. Um, this webinar will be recorded as well, so we'll hopefully have it up in the next few days if you want to uh, listen back or anything like that. Um, so today we're absolutely thrilled to have a fantastic lineup of speakers. I'm um, very grateful for them to be here today. Um, and our topic, Dancing in Dementia, it's slightly a uh, you know, departure for us to have something on dementia. So we're really pleased to, uh, to be able to have that. Um, so I'll just introduce our speakers um, before we get started. So we have Carmen McKenna. She's a dancer, educator, historian, ethnochoreologist, I hope I got that right, and researcher. Uh, she's also the founder of the Munster Academy of Irish Dance. We have Sean Donald O'Shea. He's a dementia advisor in Limerick City and County for the Alzheimer's Society. He's the founding member of, um, he's a founding member of the Dementia Carers Campaign Network and uh, very importantly, a member of the DRNI's Management Committee. Um, Jennifer Moran Street, she's a lecturer in the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology at Technical University of the Shannon in Limerick. She's the founder and PI of the Loss and Grief Research Group in the Social Sciences Connections Research Institute at TUS. And then we have Neve Kelly. She's a PhD student at the Technical University of the Shannon in Athlone, where her research focuses on the development and implementation of dance exercise intervention for people living with dementia and care partners of people living with dementia. Um, so we're very happy to have them all here today and they're very welcome. Um, just to say before I hand over uh, to Carmel, um, just to say that if you have any questions at any stage, just pop them in the Q&A box. It should be down at the bottom of your screen to the right. Um, any questions that come up during the um, during the presentations, just fire them in there, and we'll be able to uh, to have a Q and A session at the end of the presentation. Um, so, with that, I'll hand over to you, Carmel. Thanks so much. Okay, I'll just try to share my screen here. Well, there you go, Sean Donald. Lovely photo of you. Um, okay, so. Um, Thank you, Vanessa, for the introduction. And it's great to be back with the team of Sean Donnell and Jennifer as we speak about the Some Dance to Remember uh, program of adaptive Irish Cayley dance for people living with dementia and the research around that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing how Neve is getting on with her own research today as well. Uh, so it's clear to me that because we all have a connection with the Technological University of the University, TUS is actually at the forefront of research on dancing with dementia. But moving on to some dance to remember, what are we talking about? Well, essentially, it's the first of a kind adaptive Irish Cayley dance programme, which was co-developed by me in my role as a principal and creative programme director at Munster Academy of Dance with and for people living with dementia and their partners. And then what do we mean by Cayley dancing? Well, it's vernacular or folk group Irish dancers with a partner or partners and it generally consists of a small number of simple repetitive movements so that patterns are created in, through and on a dance space. It can be danced for competition, but more generally it's used in social and recreational contexts. The emphasis in Kaylee is on enjoyment and interacting with your partner and other dancers. So the characteristics of Kaylee lend itself to adaptation and allows for the creation of a community based on mutual interest, which is not defined by age, gender, physical or cognitive ability. There isn't one factor that contributed to the development of the Some Dance to Remember uh, dance program. Rather, there were, it was something that evolved organically over time, but I will go through a few factors which definitely influenced the development of the dance program. So firstly, in 1997, I founded Munster Academy of Irish Dance in Limerick and then expanded to Clare in 2007. 
And the values that we have at Munster Academy were shaped by my own experience of Irish dance, which consisted of a lot of fun, a lot of enjoyment, and an intrinsic reward in terms of being a part of a community of mutual interest. My own beliefs in Irish dance is that it's the folk dance, and so it's for all the people, and that anyone who wants to should be able to take part in Irish dance. And so inclusivity is at the heart of all that we do. So we serve all ages, all levels, and all abilities. In 2009, then, I completed my Master's in Ethnochoreology at the University of Limerick. So ethnochoreology, which is, it, is hard to say, is the analysis of dance in and of its cultural context. But it opened my eyes to a few things. And some of those were that dance is more than just dancing physically. It is about movement across the floor or across a space. Okay, So in some cultures, there is no word for dance. And so we expand our notion of what we mean by dance. Um, we also expand our notion of what we mean by participation. Again, it's not just physically performing in the dance, but I'll do a little bit more on that later. And one of the key things I learned during the Masters of Ethnochoreology was to reflect on my Irish dance practice. So reflecting on the all ages, all levels and all abilities within Munster Academy, you said we do. And the answer was, well, not really. Okay, so in terms of all levels, yes, we offered uh, classes for beginners to advanced dancers. All ages, yes, if you were 40 or under. And all abilities, it was a definite no. So this is in my head, while a variety of other factors just kind of coincided with the development of the dance program. And one of those factors was uh, my dancers were performing at a care home, which was not specifically for people living with dementia, but did have some residents who had dementia. And one of my dancers was performing a dance called the Blackbird. And a lady who had dementia was sitting there. She sat straight up in her chair and her feet started to move along with the steps that my dancer was doing. So while my dancers were changing their shoes, I spoke with this lady and it turns out that she had been a dancer some 80 years previously. I asked her then if she wanted to join in with one of our dances and she was only too delighted to do so. And that is when we began to dance with people with dementia rather than just for them. Another trigger uh, was in 2013. So Leah Carl Gordon seen here on the left in this not great quality photograph. Leah uh, is from Brazil and was studying social care at university there. And she also was a social care worker in Brazil. And she was here on an Erasmus program and we spoke about how she was teaching the people living with dementia that she worked with, the Walls of Limerick, which is an Irish Cayley dance. And I found that very interesting because it suggested to me that people with dementia uh, can learn new things, but also that Irish Cayley dance is not necessarily just for people for whom it has a cultural significance. So as we continue to work with li people living with dementia, we began to categorize and catalog all of our uh, adaptations that we were using. And we developed a, our first handbook of adaptations in 2017. And so the Some Dance to Remember dance program, the first and still only known program of adaptive Irish Killy dance for people living with dementia was officially born. So what do we mean by adaptive Irish Killy dance? Well, we aim to be as inclusive as possible. Essentially, it is person-centered Killy. There is no right or wrong way to do it. There is only the participant's way. All adaptations, uh, which focus on ability happen within a framework of the Cayley dance form. And we work with, guide and suggest, but we do not impose or instruct and in people living with dementia. Participation in its broadest sense is encouraged, so that can be physically dancing, clapping and tapping along to the music, or simply just watching the dance activity unfold. And so what might it look like? Well, hopefully this video will work and hopefully you will be able to hear the music. And I'd ask you just to check the feet and you'll see the variety of uh, footwork on display. Some people are walking, some are hopping, some are dancing what are known as forward one, two, threes, and some are dancing what are known as skip two, threes, but there is a variety of footwork on display. So fingers crossed, this works. <laughs>
Okay. So hopefully that worked and you were able to see the variety of footwork on display. So as I mentioned earlier, we catalogued and categorized our adaptations and we created a handbook uh, of adaptations when working with people living with dementia. And I also mentioned that we aim to be as inclusive as possible. So that would suggest that we have all parts of the jigsaw in place. Well, obviously not, because as we know, there are many different types of dementia and each individual is impacted in a unique and individual way by their specific dementia. So the program is constantly evolving. And as we learn new ways to work with people living with dementia, we document and categorize those adaptations and upgrade our work. This helps to build our knowledge and our understanding so that we can continue to work effectively in Kaylee Dance with people living with dementia. So that's the dance program. And how did the research itself come about? Well, it began with a series of what if conversations uh, in 2015 in Uppsala uh, University in Sweden between Jennifer and myself. And we spoke of my experience of working with people living with dementia and of our mutual experiences of family members with dementia and their responses to Irish dancing on television. Those responses included smiling and joy and chattiness and talking of memories that watching the Irish dance had evoked. In essence, there was a sparkle in their eyes again. And we wondered, what if the responses to Irish dance that we had noted was more than just a coincidence? What if there was research on the physical, cognitive, social and emotional benefits to dancing with dementia? What if there was no research? And what if we could then design a research program to investigate and explore the effects of participating in Irish Cayley dance? So we began to look at the available research and we found that there was none of any kind on Irish dancing specifically for people living with dementia. Although we did note that there was a study done on set dancing, which shares a lot of the characteristics of Irish Cayley dancing and that that worked for people living with Parkinson's. So we continued to ask ourselves, what if the combination of traditional Irish music with its strong rhythmic beat and Irish Cayley dance with its simple repetitive movements had benefits which could contribute to the quality of life for people living with dementia? And what if there were also benefits for carers? This led to the development of a research degree program between Social Sciences Connections Research Institute based at the Technological University of the Shannon and Munster Academy of Dance. So this was the first of a kind research degree program. And we submitted for some seed funding to then Limerick Institute of the Technological University of the Shannon and were successful. So we began the search for a suitable candidate. And for us, that suitable candidate would, be, candidate would be somebody who was familiar with dementia and would have a social care background rather than a dancing background. Because after all, if adaptive Irish Cayley is for all of, pe of the people, then the person who needed to conduct the research needed to be able to understand the dance from the perspective of somebody who's just starting out and learning how to do it. And so up stepped Sean Donald O'Shea and I will hand over to Sean now, who will take you through the research program itself. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carmel, for that uh, younger looking photo of me, Slimmer. <laughs> Thanks for making me feel bad about myself. <laughs> I'm just going to share my screen here now and um, hopefully will you let me know if you can see it. Um, is that okay, guys? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. So thank you very much. Um, and it, it's an absolute honor to be able to, to speak today. Um, and I'm going to talk you to my part of it, really. And um, some, so first of all, I suppose, um, as the title there, Some Dance to Remember, Explore the Psychosocial Function of an Adaptive Irish Cayley Dance Group Activity with People Living with Dementia and Their Carers. And um, I suppose, first of all, why why did I do this? And it was a question that I asked myself plenty of times during uh, during my master's and research. But um, my mother was a um, was an Irish dancer and an Irish dancing teacher. Um, and one of my early memories is my mother coming down to our local primary school teaching Irish dancing, and myself and my brother refusing to dance because of the embarrassment of my mother school teaching us how to dance and for, for, to my regret I never really learned um, but um, 
fast forward a few years um, um, when I was living at home and I was around 23, my mother got diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 50 years of age. Um, and is, this was a massive shock to all of us at home. You know, we didn't really know even what dementia or Alzheimer's was. And we see it was known as, and down our way as a, I was a South Kerry man, as an older person's illness, um, you know, and it was something that people would have been calling, using terms as such as doting and stuff at home. So it was just, it was really a, a, an explosion for all of us. And we didn't know how to deal with it, what to do. Um, I was a block layer at home at the time, and as I suppose as luck would have it, I hurt my back at the time as well. So I um, was able to stay at home, and I became my mother's full time carer. Um, and as as uh, we went through the journey of dementia together, um, we danced, and my mother talked great pride and probably great frustration in trying to teach me how to dance. But as the journey continued, and maybe as my mother's um, cognitive impairment increased and her mobility decreased then the dancing remained and whether it was listening to it or sitting on her seat and the legs were moving um this was something that brought her great joy and 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 something triggered me inside me saying my god you know this is something that that is is so powerful and when i was living down in south kerry at the time i got an opportunity um to take part in a social care degree course in the Limerick Institute of Technology as was at the time. Um, and with the support of my family members and friends, I was able to do this. Um, and I always laugh when I tell people I returned to college at the age of 28. I had never gone to college previously, but it was it was something that 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 really opened my eyes. And um, I was delighted to um, I suppose apply myself to that uh, with all my heart and soul, really. And um, and then once that was finished, um, I got a first class honours degree, which my mother was um, so so proud of. Um, and I went out into the working world for a while, and then I got the opportunity to um, to to take part in this research. So um, this massive, and uh, I jumped at it, and it was like the stars aligned, really, because. Um, my mother wasn't long after passing away, and it, it just felt like this. This was meant to be. So I'm. That's my sorry, long-winded answer of why I got into this. Um, so it was really through my mother. Um, so I'll just give you an overview of the research. The research took place in a daycare center in the Midwest of Ireland, and it consisted of twenty-five semi-structured interviews, and they were conducted over a nine-week period. Ten of these were with the participants living with dementia and 15 were with the care staff participants. These were done uh, before the first dance uh, session, midway point, and after the last dance session. Um, and semi-structured interviews were chosen because I suppose, you know, they're open-ended. It, it allowed the participants uh, who I was interviewing to ex um, to to give, give long-winded answers when needed. And I, it, it allowed me to explore where needed as well, their answers. Um, and very importantly, the research focused on the lived experience of the participants, um, whether that be the participants living with dementia or the care staff participants. And it consisted of six adaptive Irish Kelly dance sessions. Um, so I'm just going to sp speak about the dance sessions. Um, and as I said to you at the start, um, I wasn't a dancer. I, I, I probably, Carmel would, would, would attest to this. I still am not a great dancer. Um, so I had to attend, attend dance lessons, and I can only imagine that my mother was laughing, laughing at me, looking down at me, attending the dance lessons. And to be quite honest, you know, I went out uh, to Carmel um, and, and the Monster Academy to do the dance lessons, and I was never so far out of my comfort zone. There were, you know, these amazing teenagers dancing amazing routines, and I'm looking, and, and Carmel said, told me, now you take over. So... I, I was very close to leaving a few times. I just, because I felt so uncomfortable, but it was such the right thing to do for me for and, and for Carmel to allow me to see that because I suppose I didn't know the steps, but I, I realized that it wasn't about knowing the steps. You know, it was about participating, about having fun. And I did learn the steps. Um, and it, it, that, that experience allowed me to, I suppose, um, 
to enable it to be accessible to all people with varying levels of mobility and cognition. And, and I remember on our first dance session with the participants living with dementia and the care staff, um, we decided, well, I decided we dance Shoot a Donkey. Um, I had all the music set up, the room was perfect, you know, everything was everything was going well. And I briefly spoke about Shoot a Donkey, uh, which is uh, dance in pairs, and you advance and retire. Uh, retire together and I thought it would be grand so we set it up and I off the music went and it was a disaster it was and I, I thought I would crumble you know as I said people of varying levels of mobility and cognition you know people had more uh, better mobility and people were bumping into each other but thankfully I suppose we had taught earlier in our lessons about you know adapting dancing adapting and we adapted it i adapted it to the circular style dance where everybody went in a circle and and every participant living with dementia held the hand of a care staff participant now this this was a game changer for me uh, because i suppose those people who were worried about their own mobility and a falls risk were were, were held on either side by the hand with a, a care staff um and it promoted security as well. And I suppose one thing it promoted very much so was inclusion. And it, uh, again, it allowed, it enabled people with different mobilities, different cognitions to, uh, levels of cognition to, um, to take part. And there was people uh, who each wheelchair users taking part in this. And it was absolutely amazing. As I said, we advanced and we retreated, re uh, retired together. And the rhythm of the dance, it was just something that that, that that seemed to bring people to life. There was stamping in the feet, there was shouting in the air, and it, it we nearly got carried away on the very first session, to be quite honest, but it, it was absolutely amazing. And it was important to note as well that participation wasn't just dancing. People were observing, sitting down, clapping, you know, and it, it mirrored, I suppose, one of the, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention was on our very first dance session, we had the music playing, uh, prior to the people entering the room, which we tried to mimic as a dance hall. And as soon as the participants and the people came in, the ladies went to one uh, uh, side of the room and the gentlemen went to the other. And it, it was just something that maybe would have reflected um, what going to dance halls was um, like back in the day. Um, so it also consisted of interviews and um, the interviews were very special as well. Um, and I suppose, especially for the, um, when I spoke to people living with dementia, um, a lot of the people, you know, I suppose were very quiet, maybe um, were limited in terms of language. But one thing that stood out to me was when I mentioned dance and gave time, you know, and, 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 and just one um, excerpt from a, an interview with Eileen, which uh, was a beautiful woman living with dementia. Now, Eileen would say very little very little at all but once i spoke about dancing her eyes lit up and she uh, as you'll see here she said oh, I, I danced all my life but like that it was magic magic out of the sea her eyes just lit up speaking about dancing and it was just a powerful moment and another participant living with dementia Teresa. um an interesting thing uh story besides this with, with Teresa was on about my fourth week coming in we'd always start with shoot a donkey and when I came in, and I think it was week four, she looked at me and she said, shoo the donkey. So it was something that, that triggered her memory. And when I was asking her about her, um, when she was going to dance halls, or did she go to dance halls when she was younger? And she said, well, I can remember the first time I went into the dance hall, I made a beeline for Lady's Choice and I married him. I can't believe it. And she was roaring, laughing. She spoke about how she met her husband at one of these dances. And just, I suppose, from the other side, from the care staff, um, and Kira, one of the care staff, when I was speaking with her and, you know, speaking about the, the activity and the session and the dance session, she said, not, not, not even like for the clients, for the staff, for the managers, there was a buzz around that wasn't here before. And it was, it was absolutely clear to see. Um, and I'm just going to quickly go on to the results of the research. Um, so the interviews and dance activity provided beneficial psychosocial outcomes, which include in enhanced ability to, to reminisce. Um, and this was done through ob my observations as well, because um, at the end of every dance session, we, we finished up with waltzes and maybe a few songs. 
And there was a few participants in the group dementia who would who would have been not songs. And I suppose, I suppose as well, the participants living with dementia, you'd see when the music came on, their feet started tapping and the, and, and, the, and the steps came back to them. And and from my conversations with the care staff, this wasn't something they had seen before. Um, there was a positive influence on mood and psychosocial well-being. Um, this, this was, I had observed this, I had learned this from the interviews with the care staff and the participants living with dementia, but also from conversations. And, and the care staff would say that there was a definite up in mood and especially I mean it was on a Friday we used to do it every Friday and there was when people were coming in the bus all the talk was about the dance session that day so it was it, it was great a positive uh, positivity for mood and actually the care uh, carers at home family members noticed um, a change uh, in mood as well and the dance activity provided for an opportunity for the care for the participants living with dementia to take part in exercise which they w usually would not have and again, this was, you know, I suppose in a lot of care day centers, um, people do take part in dancing, but it, but it but it wasn't part of their normal routine. And uh, one of the final um, results of the research was it 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 uh, its ability to strengthen bonds between care staff and people living with dementia. And and this was something that really came true in the research. And care staff saying that you know they were part they were they were providing more than just personal care. To the person living with dementia and also what it what i noticed and uh, what the research showed as well it it, it enabled the part it, it was a switch in roles it enabled the participants living with dementia to, to show the people the participants the care staff participants and myself the steps the correct steps and ways of doing it so um dementia it, it neutralized the dementia and it put we're all equal equal during it and it was just one of the most positive experiences i ever did and I suppose, like I said at the start of the research, um, all this I wouldn't have done it except for my amazing mother here and uh, a few of the pictures there. There's one of her trying to teach me how to dance, and a photo on the top corner was one of the the ones that we found recently um, of my mother back in when she was born in Boston and she danced in Boston and she danced in Ireland and she danced around the world. So um, thank you very much for this, and uh, I pass you now on to Jennifer. Thank you very much. So I will stop sharing, I think. Great. Thank you, Sean. Sorry. Can you get in there, Carmel? Sorry. Or do I need to? I yeah. think I can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Great. Everybody can see that, yeah? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Super. Listen, thanks a million, Sean. And um, I, I knew Sean as an undergraduate. Um, and thought he was special then. Um, it's rare enough to find men in social care, probably only about 10 to maybe 15% of our students um, are men. And uh, in a, even in that small percentage, Sean really, really stood out. And then it was a pleasure to work with him again as a, as a post-grad. So this morning is a little bit like getting the, uh, the band back together here, but it, it, it's lovely to, um, to hear both from him and from Carmel again. And um, like in his research, Sean recommended that there should be a pilot program that should be expanded of the Some Dance to Remember um, activity and that it should be rolled out on a more formal basis. But one of the other recommendations that he's made is that there should be more opportunities for dance and movement training in social care education programs. And I suppose that's where I come in. So I teach and have taught for 16 years now in the Department of Applied Social Sciences in the social care program at TUS. And I have a background in social work uh, in the United States. So I'm really passionate about social care education and sort of helping to shape uh, really high quality care professionals. Um, however, you know, in my experience of teaching social care in Ireland, opportunities to learn about dance and movement um, are really quite limited. And I think that's where my piece comes in around this project. So there's an aim and understanding promoted by many Irish social care educators. And I previously would have been act training the whole person to become a social care worker in all dimensions of wellness. There's lots of academic literature around this, that the use of self is what's key to a social care worker. And it's a major distinction for the profession in comparison with even social work or psychotherapy 
or, or nursing, that the use of self is at the core of what we do. And it means the whole self, not just our mind or not just our voice, but ourselves as physical beings as well. This idea that we, you know, promote this use of self was really challenged for me by Sean Donald's research and one particular incident really crystallized it. So I would often ask postgrads to come in and do a guest lecture with social care students about their research. And these lectures are generally, you know, well received by students, but there's a little comment about them afterwards. You know, you go on to the next week and no one really says anything, but it was very different in the week after Sean Donald's um, lecture. Um, I was chatting with students and one of the students commented saying, I loved his research, but I could never do something like that because I don't know how to dance. And I offered them back the idea that Sean Donnell, as he said this morning, was not specifically a trained dancer and that a willingness to learn about dance as an intervention was really all that you needed. So the conversation grew and several students then said that they would feel very uncomfortable leading an activity that required dance or movement or sports skills, especially with a group of vulnerable people. And others mentioned feeling that they were confronted with having to dance when they did not want to because of certain situations that arose while they were on their professional placements in our program, very often in placements in like the disability sector or in nursing homes or in youth services. So this led to a broader discussion with the class about the use of self, our bodies as part of a social care worker's professional toolkit, um, risk and safety on both physical and emotional levels for the person you're supporting you uh, a, a, as a person and what we have been encouraging them to do but maybe challenging them to do in this context and this made me think about the two social care program um, that I teach in and what we focus on and how are our students really taught about embodiment and creative practice so if you look at the landscape of social care in Ireland, about 1,500 students enter either level seven or level eight honors degree programs in social care or applied social studies in Ireland every year. And this number is roughly comparable to the number of nursing students that we have um, enter each year. Social care students uh, will work with, um, require who require a variety of supports and they are often the people as opposed to nurses who are asked to design or lead activities with vulnerable people and these could be adults or young people or children that participate in day and residential programs across Ireland and one of the key ways in which social care workers can engage with clients is, and I'm quoting here from Denise Lyons, who would be um, really the foremost thinker about creative practice in social care. And she says, social care workers use creative activities to teach, demonstrate, model, intervene, spend time with, have fun with, and learn about their client and each other. Yet, if you take a look at the course content of social care degrees, it reveals that dance and movement are actually mentioned rarely. Program modules generally taught in the first or second year of the degree have titles like creative studies. And this broad title implies that a wide variety of creative read. But really, does this happen in reality? In reality, these modules are mostly single semester classes. They're worth about five credits. Um, and whether dance or movement are included in the syllabus depends largely on two things, the space and facilities that the university or the institution has devoted to the module. And I can only tell you from my personal experience, physical space at a university is at a premium. The other factor that, that really matters here about whether students are gonna learn about movement um, and creative practice is the experience and the interest of the lecturer. So if the lecturers aren't dance friendly um, or there isn't space within the, the institution to provide the, the dance or movement instruction, the creative arts module or the creative studies module is going to focus probably solely on like arts and crafts. So like visual based stuff and, you know, kind of making and doing all of which is valuable, but it isn't about dance and movement. What we claim that we are. 
If dance and movement are not emphasized within Irish social care edu um, education, then we are missing huge opportunities to expand our students' skills. Body-based interventions and movement are used across diverse populations with huge benefits. Increased self-recognition, self and other distinction, self-awareness on a bodily level, and that really plays into um, a, lo a lot of safeguarding um, uh, knowledge for people and confidence for people. Um, we're missing out on opportunities to kind of teach about appropriate intimacy and appropriate touching. And all of these things positively influence social understanding and personal confidence. And we haven't even mentioned the, the benefits to your physical health, which I'm sure um, our, our, our colleague uh, Neve will. Um, but also the joy and the social connection and all the other dividends that group social dance can offer. Social care is the newest registered and regulated health uh, and care profession in Ireland and CORU, the government regulating body, specifies that students should in fact graduate with knowledge and training in a full range of recreational interventions. So it's really a priority that we make sure that we are actually doing what we are saying to Koru we are doing. So from my perspective as a, as a lecturer in social care, I think Irish social care needs uh, a dance off in which we actually teach about movement and inclusive dance as part of our curriculum, whether it's in supporting people who are living with dementia, but also supporting anyone else that we may work with as social care practitioners. Within my own program at TUS, I'm advocating for at least one full module on dance and movement and also the development of short courses and CPD opportunities for practitioners who have already graduated. In short, I think we need to get moving and hit the floor. And just to mention as a further outgrowth of, of some dance to remember, um, which I think is something that has clearly captivated Carmel and, and uh, Sean Donald and myself. Carmel and I have a forthcoming chapter entitled Care to Dance and Dance to Care, and that is going to be part of an edited text entitled Global Perspectives on Probing Narratives in Healthcare, and that text will be available later this month. We're also working with Alzheimer Scotland in a collaborative comparative research project looking at the psychosocial benefits of Scottish folk country dance for people living with dementia in Scotland and their carers. Again, that's going to involve social sciences connections and Munster Academy of Dance. And just last night, uh, a community rollout of some dance to remember started here in Limerick at Dementia Social Clubs and Cafes. And that again is with the help of Carmel and Munster Academy Tus and um, the ASI really through Sean Donald's work with them. So it started this week. We're planning on doing some kind of parallel research with our Scottish partners um, from these sessions as well. If I return again to Sean Donald's work, another one of his recommendations that he made was that more research is needed on the physical effects of dancing for people living with dementia. And I'm delighted now to say that our colleague Neve Kelly from the TUS Athlone campus will now be able to talk a little bit perhaps about that part of her work on the physical benefits. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, all your presentations are fantastic. Uh, so thanks, guys. Well, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Perfect. So. Good morning, everyone. Uh, like was said, my name is Neil Kelly, and I am a second year PhD student in the Technological University of the Shannon in Athlone. Um, just a little in bit of my background is that I have a background in sport and exercise health science and in sports performance analysis. So my project is the development of a dance exercise intervention for people living with dementia and their care partners. My supervisors on this project are Dr. Claire McDermott, Dr. Fiona Skelly, and Dr. Kieran Dowd, who all work in the College and Technological University of the Shannon with me, and we're all part of the SHE research group. We also have Professor Desmond O'Neill, who works in Pali University Hospital, and Dr. Noel McCaffrey, who is the medical director of Exwell, uh, working with this project as well. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of what my project is and what we're doing at the moment and what we've done so far today. 
but that's okay. Uh, so my project, so there's two main parts to my project. And the first part is to develop a dance exercise intervention. So we're doing this by first exploring what's been done in previous research and in surrounding areas as well and with the use of patient and public involvement. So this just means that we're going to make sure that perspectives, opinions and experiences of people that with a lived experience of dementia are included and involved when we are developing this dance exercise intervention. The second part then is to the implementation and evaluation of uh, a dance exercise intervention. So we're going to be looking at the short term and long term effects on both physical and mental health um, for people living with dementia and care partners. And we're also going to be looking at reasons that people don't want to take part and reasons why they might drop out as well. So going back to patient and public involvement then, so or PPI as it's sometimes known. So as I mentioned, it just means that we are including everyone's perspectives, opinions and experiences. And this is really important as particularly for this population, their opinions haven't always been valued when it comes to looking at the history of it. And particularly in research, this is very true. So we thought it was really important to ensure that it was part of each stage of our project. So one of the first things we did was to set up a participant advisory group. And I did this with the help of the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, who have been fantastic. So that's a little picture there of us at one of our meetings. So my participant advisory group, there's four members and there's two people who are living with dementia and two care partners in my group. So they've been helping me through with different stages of the project, with different areas of engagement. So just a few examples would be in the first part of my project, uh, I have been doing interviews and focus groups. So they help me with the interview guide questions. They will be helping with the interpretation of the results and the suitability of the intervention as well. So looking at the kind of background and why this, we felt this was important, I just want to mention as well, the little numbers at the end of my sentences are just the links to my sources of information. But anyway, the background. So dementia is classified as a syndrome and it's characterized as the loss or deterioration of two or more cognitive abilities. So such as a decline in working memory or a diminished judgment and understanding, but they're just examples and this can be caused by brain disease or injury. So globally dementia cases are on the rise and a reason for this is the aging population worldwide. But we know that medications are available and they're constantly improving and we've seen this even within the last week. There are still limitations to these medications as there's still currently no cure for dementia. So as a result of this, many different lifestyle related treatments are becoming increasingly popular in hopes to help with the different symptoms of dementia. So interventions such as like art, exercise, music and different technology interventions are all becoming increasingly popular. So looking into the methodology or the process of how we are going about developing and the different steps in this project, so the Medical Research Council framework is informing the methodology of my project, as this is known as the best practice for intervention development. And there's four steps in this framework. So today I'm just going to be looking at the first step, which is the development stage. So in the development stage, we have the first step, which is to gather a base of evidence. Um, and we did this with a literature review. So looking at what's been done in research before in this area. We continued on this base of evidence by conducting focus groups and interviews with people living with dementia and care partners. Um, the data is being analysed using thematic analysis, and this is going to help to develop the intervention components. And then finally, these components are going to be presented to a professional stakeholder group involving exercise and healthcare professionals. So going back to the literature review for the moment, so looking at interventions in exercise, uh, for people living with dementia. There has been many done and many have seen benefits, including strength training, in yoga, tai chi, walking and in dance. So today I am going to be talking about dance, of course. So when we're looking at dance in comparison to other general structured exercise interventions, they have both seen benefits on brain function, structure and connectivity. 
They both have protective measures against cognitive decline. They've both seen re to be reducing risk factors related to heart disease. So things like your blood pressure or your cholesterol levels. But dance in particular has seen greater psychological positive changes, such as reducing feelings of depression and loneliness and increasing positive feelings such as positive mood and quality of life. So looking more specifically at dance and dementia then, so we know dance is seen as quite an enjoyable, versatile and adaptable form of, ex form of exercise, which has been mentioned. Combines physical activity with social interaction and mental stimulation. And it can also help to maintain balance and gait. And this is really important in this population. So previous research shows that people living with dementia and care partners are more likely to continue participating in a dance exercise intervention than a different form of exercise. There's been a good bit of research on different dance genres and they found that dance genres related to participants culture was preferred. So in Ireland that would be Irish set and Kaylee dancing. We know uh, people living with dementia have found that dance can help to improve their self-expression and awareness and this in turn can help with their communication skills. Uh, dance for care partners has also seen uh, improvements in their physical and mental health and shows that improvements in physical function can allow for better ability to care and better quality of care as well. In a study that looked at a dance class for people living with dementia and their care partners they saw the care partners saw positive improvements in social and emotional connection with their care recipient. So that's what was kind of was seen in the research already. So that was our literature review. And I added on to this um, with qualitative methods like focus groups and interviews. So I conducted nine interviews with people living with dementia and five interviews with care partners and also three focus groups with care partners as well. So these were done either online or in person, depending on the preference of the person being interviewed. And the reason for this was we just wanted to talk to people with a lived experience of dementia and hear their thoughts, feelings, preferences in terms of physical activity and exercise. So I have conducted all of my focus groups and interviews and they've all been transcribed, written out, and I am currently in the data analysis stage. So I'm using thematic analysis to um, analyze my data. And what this means is that I have the conversations written out in front of me and I'm looking for patterns within the conversations. And then I am grouping these patterns together into themes. And with these themes, then I'm gonna be pairing them with evidence from the literature review. And this is what's going to inform the components of the dance exercise event. So that's where I'm at at the minute. So the next steps then, once I've finished the analysis of all my data, I'm going to be going back to my participant advisory group and we're going to be engaging with them about the results. So we want to see if the results we found kind of reflect their thoughts and feelings on it as well. Uh, once we have spoken to our participant advisory group, this will allow us to then fully develop the intervention components. And we're going to bring these intervention components to healthcare and exercise professionals to get their expertise on what we have designed and how it's going to run. So once we've done that, we'll be able to finalise our dance exercise intervention. And we can then finally begin start setting up and recruiting for our intervention as we are hoping to start it in September. And it's going to run for nine to 12 months. And as I mentioned, we're going to be measuring immediate and long-term response in people living with dementia and care partners. And we're going to be looking at their physical fitness levels, their strength, both upper and lower body, and their psychological well-being and quality of life. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciate your attention. And if anyone does have any questions or wants to contact me about the project, you can contact me via email, Twitter or Instagram. So thanks, everyone. That's me done. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll see if... Stop sharing there, will I? Yeah, Nikki, stop sharing and I'll see. Oh, yeah, we're back to here now. Yeah, so thanks so much for that. It got to be really interesting to see what um, what findings you have, you know, from the intervention. It's, you know, you kind of feel like you're wanting the next episode next week. 
<laughs> like in the days before you could scre- stream uh, the next episode, but um, you'd have to wait for a week. But yeah, no, we, we obviously we, we'd love to hear what, what comes out of this because it's very interesting. I found it so interesting that um, in the literature you found that dance exercise, that they're more likely to stick with the dance exercise rather than other exercise, which... You know, I, I'm a complete neophyte. I don't know. But, you know, you just think if dance is fun, it's more likely to yeah. be that simple. No, that's definitely a part of it all, right? Yeah, like it's with all exercise, including dance, it's going to be difficult to, there's still going to be people dropping out and stuff, but that's what, what the research says anyway. So yeah, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thanks so much for that. We have uh, we have a few questions in the Q&A that we have seven minutes left, so we should be able to get through them. Um, so I will start with just um, a couple of comments. So um, it was saying, really, so this is for uh, Sean Donald. Um, so it's just to say, really like the theme of participation coming through from what speakers are reporting, including the links to people beyond those dancing. Um, and the point raised about transmitting the buzz to care staff, that sounds helpful and important. Any tips around good practice to enable this, please? Asks Chris. Oh, yeah, um, well, like the, the buzz, I, I think you couldn't help but get wrapped up in the buzz, to be quite honest. But, you know, I suppose um, it was enabling all staff to be involved. You know, I suppose in, in, in our, um, I think it was probably we three or four it was um the day center there was also um it was also a respite uh uh part of it as well and the night staff it was interesting to see that the night staff would get involved as well and they would set up the room for the friday so i suppose what i learned from that was you know that that even when i was gone that there was people talking about it and i suppose witnessing it um and and i think that grew internally you know um so I don't know, is there a, a correct answer to say uh, how do you try to do it? I think it was just embedded in, 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 in from from observing and listening, observing the dancing and, and witnessing how how enjoyable it was for everybody. You know, and I, I think it, it, it was the buy-in as well from all the care staff and the participants living with dementia. Like, it, it was just so positive. I, I just, I think it transmitted it itself. You know, if, in, in, in a, if, if that answers the question, I hope. And if anybody else wants to pop in or maybe have anything on it, but you just couldn't help it, Vanessa. If you're there yourself, you just you'd be just drawn in towards it. You know, um, to such a stage, you know that some of the staff were trying to work their shifts around it. Wow. You know, That's which amazing. which was which was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose one of the I suppose one of the limitations was you know that staff were on different shifts. You know, and and Maybe sometimes that you're they're down staff a few days and you know you're you've less staff available, you know. Um, but but overall it was amazing. Great. And has your specific research on Dobel, has that been published? It's inside in uh Tuss, isn't the Carmel and Jennifer, so I suppose that's that's where it is um in the art. Yeah, it will be available through the TUS repository from October online. Um okay. yeah. Hopefully, yeah. And, and then a question then for um for you, Carmel. Um, is this kind of you know the the program is it only available through the Monster Dance Academy or are more dance studios coming on board for other parts of the country? Or I was actually wondering that myself because it's you know it just would be amazing to see something like that rolled out. What a beautiful. Um, um <laughs> this is actually kind of the next step is we have a train the trainers program developed uh so at, currently the only uh people who are offering it is monster academy of dance and clearly that's not feasible in the long term so we have developed a train the trainer program which we are hoping that we may get funding for um but we'll be rolling it out from september onwards anyway so yeah but it will be offered through monster academy of dance so just keep an eye on um all of our social media. I must send you the links, uh, Vanessa, that you can share maybe with people on board. That'd be great. Yeah. yeah. And it's just a matter then of you know whoever's interested to sign up, kind of, or you yeah. know, is there yeah. anybody you know specifically targeting like you know care homes or um no um the people who can sign up really it's anybody. Um so we're looking at social care professionals, healthcare professionals, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, but also volunteers people working in community development, uh, sports coaches, basically anybody who's interested, uh, as well as dance teachers, uh, okay. because obviously 
<laughs> but I think that there's, there's a different issue with dance teachers and trying to train their expectations of what to expect. And that's, that's a different type of training that's needed. So, um, yeah, so from September, please God, okay. we're all guns blazing. Yeah. Okay, great. And this is a question, I suppose, for everybody, really. Um, so it's just a comment from Kristen. She's saying, this is such lovely work to hear about. Thank you all for sharing. Can I ask, did you use live musicians at all? I wonder whether you think having live musicians that could adapt in the moment could enhance this amazing work. Having the ability to request familiar songs that people might have danced to in the past could add another layer. It's an interesting one. If, yeah. if I can jump in there too, we've, um, I suppose, like Neve in some other um, applications and things that we're pursuing. We've also been working with a PPI network um, that in, includes carers and people living with dementia, uh, with dementia, apologies, through the ASI. And that's one of the suggestions that's come back to us, but not just um, sort of your average Kaylee band um, that you might come, but maybe within that Kaylee band also include people who might be living with dementia and their carers to also help to provide the music or be be supported to work with others to provide the music would be really exciting. Um, and so I think that's in, in some future programs um, that we're doing is something that we want to include. And would I be saying that right, Carmel, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just uh, the community, some dance to remember that we rolled out last night uh, in Limerick we will have live musicians on our last evening of this taster program specifically for that reason to see if it makes any difference or personally you cannot i feel that you cannot beat live music uh, and i would have musicians there every time but they cost money and that's not always feasible so unfortunately and yeah. and i suppose just from terms of my research um you know when we were doing the dance activities of course with you know the you loved the live music and per, i suppose the feasibility of it as well wasn't and uh, what we weren't able but also i suppose for myself you know i i i had a speaker set up but i was working it off my phone and it allowed me maybe to stop immediately when needed you know if things weren't going so i, I think it worked very well for that but i i agreed moving forward it would be great to have the live music but um I was also able to play requests off the off the phone at the very end, which, which, which you know, and we could maybe s speed it up or slow it down as as needed. Like, but like you said, you, you can't beat the live music, so wouldn't it be great? Yeah, that sounds brilliant. So we've just one. It's twelve o'clock. So I'm just one last question here that just came in. Um, have you looked at the parallels with traditional circle dance, which has sometimes been used with people with dementia? Um, I don't know who, who who's the best um, can take that question. Well, I'll start and Sean Donnell, you can finish. Um, so when Sean Donnell was attending dance lessons, I, I did suggest to him that other research uh, had suggested that traditional da circle dances from other cultures uh, seem to be the most appropriate format and that he should give it a go. And certainly, Sean Donald, you gave it a go with the circle dance uh, for yeah. Shoe the Donkey. Shoe the Donkey is normally done um, in couples, as, as Sean Donald mentioned, but they adapted it to a circle. Um, Sean Donald, yeah. over to you. And it was, like I said in the presentation, it was like the Euro 8, like, wow moment, because, as I said, when we started, it just went wrong. It wasn't working with dancing in the couples. And and like we said, we, we I suppose it was something that we we had planned for possibly happening and dancing in the couples it, it, in in the circle it, it's it's just the best way to go about it really and it's not about the steps it's not about you know getting the steps right around people were look i was i was probably the person that was poorest at the steps in carmel you see me last night i probably i'm still holding carrying that flag but it was just enjoyable you know and 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 again that that circle that circle cell dance i think really added to that no. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just conscious of time now. We've gone over just by two minutes, but still. So um, I just uh, want to finish up there. I just want to finish by saying a huge thank you uh, to our speakers who've been absolutely fabulous. It's been so interesting. This is not really something that you maybe hear about that often. So it's been just great to to have you all here and to, um, you know, to be able to, to, to learn so much. It's been absolutely fabulous. So just thank you so much to Carmel McKenna and Michelle Loche, Jennifer Stritch and Neve Kelly. Thanks a million. Just to say as well, this will be um, on YouTube, hopefully in the next few 
few days. Um, and I know we even had people from Australia actually emailing asking, oh, this is on the wrong time for us. And can, can will it be recorded? So I was happy to say it will be. So um, people can look back and um, and get that. So, yes, yeah, so I just say thank you so much again. And everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Thanks Vanessa. Vanessa. Bye.